In a previous video, I've looked at why we buy shares. So in this video, I want to answer a fairly simple question in theory, which is how you go about it. So, you've decided you want to buy some shares. You've decided they meet your uh, risk profile. You've decided that's a good way to go, but how do you do it? Well, the first point to note is that you can't buy every share that's in existence because there are two types of company and most of them are the type on the left. By number, the UK is dominated by private companies. That means the directors own the shares. The only way, or friends of the directors or selected shareholders, the only way you're going to get in is if those people decide to sell you shares. So there are football clubs out there, for example, where the shares are held by the owner, um, directors, perhaps some fans, and you're not going to get to buy them unless somebody sells. So those are not really the shares we're talking about buying through a broker, although there are plenty of them, they're the majority of shares in the UK, and there are some big names that have the limited badge at the end. That tells you it's a private company. So we're talking about buying the smaller number that are publicly available for trading. Now the clue is in the PLC title there. That means that you and I could buy the shares. It's made even easier where those shares are available on a public exchange. There are a few what are called unlisted PLCs out there, where the shares might be relatively illiquid. Thinking about if you're into football, Arsenal Football Club, for example, for quite a while. But if a company is a PLC and its shares are made available in a public market, like the London Stock Exchange, that means you can get hold of them fairly easily with the help of a broker. All right. Now, when I say you can get hold of them, just bear in mind, something I cover in other videos, that when shares are first released onto the public market, you probably can't get hold of them. IPOs are where companies, through a broker, generally handpick certain investors to buy the shares. Bit of a shame if you're a retail investor that you are buying shares that are already available for trading. So why do you need a broker? What are they doing for you? Well, a broker sits between you and the markets. Now people often wonder what the markets are. The markets are just collections of other people who've got an interest in that particular share. So you're not buying or selling to and from the company. You're not selling your shares back to Tesco or buying them from Tesco. All right. Equally, it's not usually your broker selling their own personal shares to you. What's happening is the broker is acting as an intermediary between you and other investors. So if you're buying, somebody else is selling. That's life. You've got a different opinion on the prospects for that stock. All right. And the broker acts as an intermediary, taking out some commission to link you to other investors who may want to trade shares. And that's just a point worth bearing in mind. Now then, types of service. So you're going to go through a broker. You need an agent, just like you go through an estate agent to buy a house. You don't have to, but it is the way it's generally done. It does make the administration and so on a lot easier. So you're going to go through a broker. All right, what are you going to do with that broker? And you've got three service levels. The cheap and cheerful DIY investing route, where you're basically on your own, is execution only also known, not surprisingly, as just XO. That's where you're just going to give the broker an instruction. They're not going to help you. They're not going to advise you on anything. All right? And you will have the share bought for you pretty much there and then. All right? It tends to be a little bit cheaper than the other more sort of full service options because, frankly, you're not getting much for your money. You're just getting the execution of the trade, good or bad idea as it may be. Move up a level, and you've got advice plus execution. Now, that's where the broker can do a couple of things for you at the sort of, you know, the first level might be they say, well, look, give me a ring and I will advise you about um, your investment decision, maybe even come up with a few suggestions myself. Or the next level up is where they say, I'll do all that for you and I'll help you construct a portfolio that's diversified, balanced in the right sectors, geographies and so on. All right, a little bit more expensive, but there you've got a kind of two-way relationship between you and the broker. It's not just you and the machine, as it were. And then the highest level, which can come at a price insofar as you need to have a certain amount of you know, money under management sometimes, but the highest level is called, oops, pardon me, discretionary management. And that's where you hand over your money and somebody else manages it for you. You can be involved, but essentially they're making the day-to-day -day decisions. That's useful for people who don't have the interest or the time to manage their money day-to-day -day or feel they don't have the knowledge to do so. So there it is, various levels and naturally, the uh, cost of doing business as you move up the arrow tends to increase slightly. You're basically getting more for your money in that sense. So you need to make a decision about what kind of broker you want to use, and I'll help you out with a few pointers specifically on how you might do that in a moment. Now, into 
uh, dealing, the practicality. So you've decided, for example, you're going to use a certain type of broker and you want to do a deal, you want to go and buy some shares. Just some admin here, not very exciting, but what sorts of things would you, will you, will you expect to tell the broker, either by tapping into a keyboard, all right, to do a kind of execution and type trade, or on the phone? You will need to have up your sleeve, obviously, which share you want to buy, how many, are you buying or selling, naturally enough. Now, here's one worth mentioning. Are you trading now at the market price, or are you, you know, prepared to wait for the right price? There is an order type, and you can talk to a broker about this, called a limit order, which enables you to say, well, I want to trade. I'm willing to trade, but I'm willing to wait to get the price I want. All right, if you're in a hurry, you just take the market price. But in certain circumstances, it can be useful to, to hang on and see if you can just improve on the current price a little bit. Just bear that in mind. Now, broking isn't free. It doesn't matter what level of service you go for, it's not free, so just bear in mind there are costs. The bid to offer spread, I'm afraid you suffer that on buying a car, or if you go to a second-hand car dealer, the price at which you can buy a car, unfortunately, uh, tends to be different to the price at which you sell a car, because the dealer's trying to buy off you cheap and sell more expensive. Well, that works in the equity market as well. And my advice here is just watch it, because less liquid stocks will tend to have a wider gap between the buying and selling price. So it's always worth checking. When you look up a share price in a newspaper, for example, you're probably looking at the mid-market price, not the price you can actually deal at. So that's always something worth checking. Deal commission, that's what the broker charges you to execute the trade. That can be a price per trade, or it might be a percentage of the deal value. Depends on the broker. Stamp duty, I'm afraid you won't get away often without paying that. That's a, that's a tax paid to the government. Covers, in theory, the re-registration cost of shares uh, paid by the buyer. Okay, based on the amount you pay for the shares. Uh, contract notes summarise all this for you, by the way. And just bear in mind, if you sell a lot of shares, you may eventually have a capital gains tax bill to pay if you make a profit. Now, you can mitigate that. All right, there is a tax-free allowance every year, and you've got an ISA allowance on top of that. So there are ways to reduce that, but for some people, that's something else to bear in mind. Now then, how do you choose a broker? Now, I mentioned some of these points when I talked about the different styles of service. But, just give you a few pointers. What do you want to buy? Are you looking for a broker that just offers equity trades? Do you want bonds and the expertise required to go with them? All right, are you looking to buy retail bond shares? Are you looking to buy international shares, UK? All right, what is it you're after? And that will, to some extent, influence the broker you choose. How much advice do you need? Valid answers range from none, thank you, I'm pretty confident, I'm pretty knowledgeable, I've got the time, I'll do it myself, through to actually, you know what, I want help with structuring and managing the portfolio as well as my kind of uh, trading or investing decisions. How much time and interest have you got? Some people love the idea of sitting down for a couple of hours every day, rummaging through detailed information about shares and constructing a portfolio. Others, quite understandably, don't. All right, they're frankly too busy in a lot of cases. How often will you buy or sell? That can influence the structure of the charges you pay with some brokers and how much have you got to invest. Some of the top level services may place a sort of barrier on the minimum amount that needs to be invested and that's just worth bearing in mind too. Also, if you want to go into slightly more exotic instruments or shares, you may find that you have to be a sort of different type of investor, you have to be vetted a bit more heavily. So just things to bear in mind as you make your choice. Now, where can you get more information? All right, so you, you, you want to set yourself up as uh, an investor. Books, yeah, they can, some, some books are good, some are better than others, um, can be relatively hard going. Public sector organisations, actually not as popular as perhaps they should be. Uh, that's been proved in a couple of recent surveys by the CFA Institute, for example. The media, for a lot of people, that's where they like to get information about this kind of stuff. They read stories, they read share tips and so on. I would just caution you that the media are there to sell newspapers, to get eyeballs on the page. So just be careful, because they do create quite a lot of noise. As soon as something happens, they tend to panic. I tell everybody to rush, herd, like in and out of shares. Just be a little bit careful there. You, know, you need to um, screen what you read a little bit. If in doubt, turn off the TV, put down the newspaper, don't touch your account. And a stockbroker wealth manager. Now, um, a recent survey suggested that these two are quite a popular source of information and initial ideas, but you know you will need to do quite a lot of homework to sort of run your own account. That's one piece of advice that I would give you. Now, other related videos. That was quite quick. That was the bones of how to buy shares. For more information from me, 
Videos include why buy shares, and you touched on that in this video. What's an IPO? If you're thinking, what's that process by which shares are initially issued into the market? There's a video on that. And then what do brokers do? I mentioned it in brief here. There's a bit more detail in that video. Any questions or suggestions for future topics, please email me, editor at killip.com.